Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we have Dr. Shannon Bart, who's the Department Head of Risk Assessment and Biological Services at Keystone Environmental, an engineering consult an environmental consulting firm. Dr. Bart has over 25 years of experience in environmental and ecological toxicology, marine ecology, environmental risk assessment, environmental science, pharmacology, and biomedical research. A Vancouver native, she earned a bachelor degree in biological sciences from Stanford University while on a track and field scholarship a PhD in biological oceanography from MIT and a Woods Hole and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and she was a postdoctoral fellow at Tufts. She is the former director of Marine Ecotoxicology Eco Laboratory and an assistant professor at environmental science and biology at Dalhousie University. She is the founding director of Coastal Scene Investigation which supports interdisciplinary environmental science research and public marine environmental education programs and I think she's going to talk about that today. Yes. So welcome Shannon. Thank you very much. Great. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is environmental toxicology but show you where the linkages are between um, human health and the marine environment. So um, I'm going to be giving you um, some short snippets about some different studies that I've been involved with, looking at things at different levels of biological organization. So um, I'm a marine ecological toxicologist, and I apply my work towards human health. So how do I manage to do that? So what I'm interested in is how chemicals are moving throughout the environment and what their fate, their disposition, what is their impact on both human health and organisms that are, li that are living in the environment. And what can we learn about animals that are resistant to exposure to contaminants that can tell us something about human health? What can animals that are resistant to natural product compounds, many of which uh, become developed into drugs, what can that tell us about drug resistance in human tumors or about resistance against different pathogens? So a lot of the work that I'll be describing seems quite ecological in nature. But we use these um, uh, ecological systems as an uh, early warning system to help us to understand what the impacts are of contaminants in the environment to ecological health and what can that tell us about human health. Because that allows us to have a chance to have regulatory changes and look at risk management measures so that we can actually make an impact before we start getting human health changes. So this provides us with this type of early warning system. And one thing I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the end of the talk is more of the sort of traditional uh, cellular mechanisms of um, toxicology and a little bit about uh, ABC transporters, which are these, uh, these figures on the side here. So I'll give you a little bit of background about how I became interested in this field. So I grew up in Vancouver, and we spent all of our summers on Hornby Island, which is a little island in uh, Strait of Georgia. And we were really lucky that we had family friends who were scientists. And uh, we found out later that they were actually world-renowned microbiologists who had defined the terms eukaryote and prokaryote uh, many, many years ago. But for us, they were just friends at the beach that had, uh, had their wellies on, and they taught us how to turn the rocks over and look for the animals underneath. And I started to notice over time that the types and the abundance of different species were starting to decrease. And I wondered what was, was going on, what might be causing that. And at the time, we had a family who came to visit uh, from Montreal, from Quebec. And that was at the time then the belugas in the St. Lawrence were washing up on the beach. And because of high levels of uh, dioxins and furans, which are um, uh, chlorinated uh, carcinogenic compounds that bioaccumulate in fatty tissue, such as blubber, uh, the whales, the actual animals, the carcasses, were considered toxic waste and were treated as such. And they were, they were big high, uh, headlines in uh, the Globe and Mail and other newspapers uh, talking about this in the 80s. And so when this family came to the West Coast, they were so excited to see everything at the beach. They took uh, armfuls of starfish and sea urchins up to their, their deck, and they were going to bring them home for three ferry rides and 5,000 kilometers in their car in the summer. So um, I suggested that maybe it would be nicer if we drew some pictures and, and uh, uh, took some photographs of the animals rather than uh, taking them from the beach. And then if everyone took animals to the beach, eventually there wouldn't be any animals left. So I realized that there was uh, people weren't um, you know, actively. Uh, there may be some people that weren't sort of familiar with sort of proper beach etiquette, how to behave at the beach without causing an environmental impact. So I started a, a youth environmental group in the 80s to raise awareness about sort of conservation and proper beach etiquette, as they called it. Did a lot of speaking to schools and, and in the media. And then as things uh, sort of rolled along, a particular event occurred in Port Alberni in which there was a uh, spill from the pulp and paper mill there. And at this time, um, the idea when you had uh, an industrial complex 
is that in the engineering, your main uh, goal when something goes wrong is to protect the equipment. So if pressure increases, you just, you just vent to the environment. So um, in the pulp and paper mill process, as some of you may be aware, at that point they were using elemental chlorine, and a byproduct of that is the production of uh, chlorinated compounds, which are carcinogenic, dioxins and furans. And to break down a tree to make it into paper, you need a lot of very corrosive uh, chemicals. So they use hydrochloric acid, sodium hydroxide, a variety of things. And these things were getting dumped into the environment if different spill events happened. So in this particular event, uh, the spill caused a massive die-off. So in the inlet, you could actually go and see where high tide was because everything below the dock pilings had, had actually, had actually uh, peeled off and had died. And so the mill applied for an increased pollution permit the next day from Environment Canada based on the fact that nothing lived in the inlet. So it's considered anecdotal evidence that anything had actually lived in the inlet the day before. So I decided it would be very helpful if we had baseline information on what species lived where along the coastline, and that could then be admissible to court were such a spill to happen again. Now, at the time that uh, this was going on, uh, so, so at this point I started thinking, well, maybe little kids taking starfish from the beach may not be the major problem that we have here. Maybe it's other things that are going on. And so um, uh, I was very fortunate that I had an opportunity when, uh, when I was uh, at Stanford. They are very generous in allowing undergraduates to compete with graduate students and postdocs to get research funding. So every year I'd, uh, uh, I'd uh, collect uh, three or four grants, come back up to BC every summer. I did that for four years. And I went into local communities uh, up and down the coastline from Prince Rupert, Powell River, uh, Vancouver Island, and uh, Howe Sound, which is where this image is from here, and looked at different sites along the pollution, along the pollution gradient, so close to mills and further away from mills. And there were some mines in some of these locations as well. And some of the challenges are we don't, have, we don't really have commercial roads in inlets unless there's a pulp mill there because that's the reason why we, have, uh, why we have those roads. So it was very difficult to get reference sites. We had no information on what the mills were like or the conditions were like before the mills were in place. The idea was to look at trends in different areas. So if you look at how it's sound here, um, uh, you've got the wood fiber mill. So Squamish is down here. You pass that on the way to Whistler. And we had a variety of sites as you go out towards uh, Powell River, as, out towards uh, Port Mellon, uh, Chaster Beach, Tunstall Bay, Lions Bay, and Porto Cove. And we've now looked at these sites for over 20 years. So um, to do this work, so has anyone in this room ever done intertidal research? There we go. Okay, so for the small, for the large number of you who have not, the intertidal zone is the area between high tide and low tide. The problem is the tide is moving, so you have a very short period of time to do that work. You have about three hours for the lowest tides of the year. And I wanted to look at the most diverse area I could get to for three hours, which is about the mid-low intertidal zone. So that's just at the edge when the kelp beds are starting to form. And so to do this work, it required that I needed a lot of manpower. So I would go into local communities. I would rec recruit uh, volunteer scientists to help me at the beach. At the same time, we also had a lot of other community members that were interested in coming to help. So we had First Nations. We had uh, local high school students, uh, different community groups. And it was a really interesting time to start doing this work because it was during the War of the Woods when we had people that were concerned about occupational health and safety because of the working conditions at the pulp mills. The um, the, the um, mortality rates from cancer were four times higher for pulp mill workers. And then you had the fishermen and the environmental groups who were concerned about the health of the fish communities and about the aesthetics for the environment in, 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 in play as well. And so you had these two different groups that were coming together that were all concerned about the same issues around pollution and about human health and environmental health and working together for that. And uh, out of that arose uh, the formation of the Georgia Strait Alliance, which put a lot of public pressure uh, because as I started to bring these groups of community members out to the beach, they started to have a real visual picture on what the impact was of contamination to their community by using the marine systems as an example. And for them to realize what was happening in their home communities where people would tell me that they worked in the pulp plants in the bleaching section and their father had died by 35 and they expected to die by 35 of cancer as well. So it helped to really crystallize for them what the impacts were by seeing the changes in those communities and having them reflect on that potentially these could be similar to what's happening at home. And that public pressure led to the creation of the Environmental Effects Monitoring Program through Environment Canada. So you can start something at the ground floor, bringing community support together, get changes in regulation, and, 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 and see effective changes happening uh, uh, nationwide. So just to give you a picture of what things look like in sort of the bad old days, so this is how sound again. These are sites, Daryl Bay and Port Mellon, that were closest to the mills with species diversity of four, five, six species. 
Then as you move to moderately exposed sites that were uh, 20, 15, 20, 30 kilometers away, you start to increase your species diversity a little bit towards 25, 30 uh, species, and then reference sites being up to 90. So very dramatic differences. And what do these sites actually look like? So when you go to a site that's highly exposed, like this one at Port Mellon, get some barnacles, some mussels, some greed algae, but turn the rocks over, it's pretty anoxic. There's not a lot that's around there. As you start to go to a more moderately exposed site like Bowen Island, what you start to see there is you start to get uh, green, little juvenile green sea urchins show up. You're starting to get, here's a juvenile crab. You've got a chitin that's here. You've got lots of starfish, a lot of more interesting things, and a greater variety of algae is on top of the rocks of seaweed. And then once you go to reference sites, every spot in the intertidal zone is coated in life, and things are growing on top of one another. So here, this was a which is a male fish which guards its mate's eggs for the summertime. So the underside of that rock was full of little baby fish that were cemented with their egg casings um, right on the top of that rock, and the father was guarding those through the summer. And then uh, orange sea cucumbers and calcareous tube worms and red sponge and bryozoan, which is a colonial organism, all coating the rocks, all sorts of beautiful life. And the other interesting thing about these midshipman fish is um, it takes a couple, six weeks or so for the fish, the babies, to develop. And what happens is, is prior to the, um, the eggs being deposited on that rock, you have the male and you have the female, and they go through this really elaborate courtship ritual. And the male's like, yeah, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And he's all ready to go. And then this juvenile, or this younger male usually comes in squirts its sperm, and then buggers off. And the other male is so confused, it doesn't really know what happened, and it's stuck sort of babysitting for the next six weeks. So in the scientific literature, they, they refer to these sort of rogue males as the, as the SF, so that they're, they're, they're the sneaky fuckers. So um, uh, as I mentioned, um, as I started to do this work, part of the public pressure put this environmental effects monitoring, which, is a, which was a, a pollution abatement program, into place. And you can see here the, the top slide with wood fiber on here. This is showing uh, basically the level of contamination in the early years when I did the studies in the uh, early 90s, where we had higher levels of uh, biochemical oxygen demand, uh, total suspended solids, and AOX was actually a measure of um, uh, chlorinated compounds. And um, those all dropped dramatically uh, over the years. So the, there's been pollution abatement that's been taking effect. So then about 10 years later, 2004, I went back to these sites to see how well they're recovering after this program went into place. And what I found is that some of the moderately exposed sites, so if we look at uh, the bottom slide, so Porto Cove, Lions Bay, Tunsil Bay, they're starting to get some recovery. They're not the level of reference sites, but we're starting to get some recovery, so it's very encouraging. However, some of the other sites, uh, Port Mellon and Darrell Bay, we haven't gotten very much recovery at all, according to this point. So uh, then, Another 10 years later, we've gone back to look at these sites again. Now, uh, we're going to talk um, uh, a little bit more about some of them. So Port Mellon, there's been some dramatic improvements up, up to about 25 species um, over the last 20 years. And that was actually the level of species that you would have gotten at uh, uh, some of the uh, moderately exposed sites in the past. Um, also, some increases in Porto Cove and Lions Bay. Uh, and some dramatic increases at Darrell Bay and Britannia Beach. Again, when I say dramatic, it's just because it's so exciting to see something that's not a barnacle and to actually see a fish that shows up at a site, but it's still highly depressed compared to a lot of other sites. So it's all, it's all in, rel in relation. So my next question was, this, uh, the work that we were doing here in 2013, the wood fiber mill is now being shut down in, How in House Sound. There is a second mill that's there. And the, um, uh, the Britannia Beach site, the old ma mine site, has gotten substantially cleaned up. Uh, there used to be acid rock drainage, which um, basically sterilized uh, the river and the output uh, into the ocean. And that had been cleaned up. So we were looking to see if there was dramatic improvements there. And there had been, that was one of two worst spots I've ever seen in BC, where there was actually zero macroscopic species at that site. So um, uh, what we've been focusing on most recently is actually habitat restoration. We don't have good legislation in Canada for orphan sites. So when an industry shuts down for economic reasons or for various other reasons, basically we walk away and our view is that nature is going to take its place and is going to clean itself up on its own. And what we're finding from this work is that that's not happening. So some sites are able to recover on their own, depending on what the conditions are, but other sites may not. And we've been trying to investigate what's causing that. Is there historical contamination there? 
Are there problems with the actual physical habitat? Is it actually missing? Were the nice rocks that the animals used to attach to, were they all actually removed off the beaches and are they now um, uh, uh, retaining walls? And that's what you'll see if you kayak down Indian Arm. Some of the old industrial sites and, and um, uh, tie-up sites for old boats, you have all these retaining walls and all those nice intertidal rocks are removed. Um, or is it an issue where a lot of the species, uh, the currents are not actually allowing the larvae to come back to the site or in fact that uh, species have to lay their eggs. So you've got to get little worms and little um, uh, snails to crawl 20 kilometers to get back to your beaches. So I'm going to tell you just very briefly about this one site in Britannia Beach, which previously had zero species diversity. And it's a little hard to see in this picture, but at the bottom here, uh, the dark coloring is all rockweed and mussels, and there's green algae as well. So a number of species have come back. So what's been really dramatic about this is so for years and years and years, there was nothing at the beach. I mean, literally nothing at the beach. EEM was introduced, and the mills were closed. And then we had this uh, uh, acid rock drainage water treatment system that went into place in 2006. So we started to see just a small number of species, very pollution tolerant species coming back uh, in 2004. But in 24, uh, 2012, what was exciting is that not only did we have species, an increase in species diversity, but the tolerance of those species to contamination. So in, in my work, one thing I did was actually categorize species as being pollution tolerant or intolerant or sensitive. And what we see here is early days, we just have really, really pollution tolerant species. But in 2012, we had pollution tolerant species, so isopods, mussels, crabs, pile worms, rockweed, but then some sensitive species like blennies and crescent gunnels, which are fish, so we get vertebrates, finally we get vertebrates coming to the site, they show up, and then red algae, which is actually very tolerant to pollution, it's starting to show up. So it's showing that there's a capacity for um, these more, more intolerant species to actually colonize a site and potential to have more recovery in the future. So one of the things we've been learning from this is how we can take sites and accelerate their recovery. And putting this back to human health again, we're under, um, uh, we're, we're having sea level rise uh, in, throughout the world based on, on uh, global climate change. With, um, and one of the concerns about that is that you can get coastal flooding. And um, that can cause um, uh, economic and uh, uh, human health and social outcomes, uh, negative outcomes from that. So we've been working with uh, the District of West Vancouver, who are actually very concerned about flooding in their area. And that's because they put a hard surface seawall along the coast, which I love because I ran on it at 5 o'clock in the morning every morning for, for 15 years. Um, but that caused a lot of coastal erosion. And because of that, the energy of the waves that are hitting the shore is very high because you have a very smooth surface that the water is moving across. So what we're doing is we're reestablishing rocky uh, kelp beds, um, and it's both subtidally and intertidally, so it becomes very bumpy you increase the rugosity, that decreases the energy of the wave. So when you have a king tide, you have a big storm event, the chances of you actually getting a flooding event decreases because you've decreased the energy of those waves. Now, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now. Um, I used to be a professor at Dalhousie University, and then when I moved back to East, um, uh, I wanted to apply some of this work to Halifax Harbor. And Halifax Harbor had a different kind of set of contamination. So they... The harbor basically was one giant toilet. So um, uh, we had 250 years of raw sewage going into the harbor. Uh, all of the uh, lobster fishermen knew the best places to fish or where all the sewage outfalls were. They didn't actually have a very good map of the, the sewage outfalls, although you can see them here. But I bet the fishermen could all tell you where they were. And um, we could even map where the pollution was going by looking to see where all the tampon uh, applicators washed up at the beaches. So we called those beach whistles. So um, we've had a big NSERC uh, um, strategic grant to look at the, um, the impacts of the, um, the actual improvement of introduction of primary treatment of the sewage. So we're really pushing to get secondary treatment. We could only get primary at that stage. So we figured, why don't we actually sh demonstrate what the, uh, what the impact is going to be of this primary. And no one had wanted to work in the harbor for like 20 years. We could, we, no one, everybody would go outside of the harbor. Nobody would work in the harbor. So what we decided to do is um, we wanted, we, it was a very interdisciplinary project, um, and we wanted to be able to um, uh, communicate our results to the public so they would have an understanding of what these impacts are. Because a lot of it is, is blind, um, because it, once it gets sort of diluted in the water, you sort of don't see what's out there. Now, unfortunately, we wanted to do before and after. 
But with the timing we had with the study, uh, the, uh, they automated the system. So first of all, when you're building a sewage treatment plant, perhaps you should not build it below sea level. That's the first lesson. The second thing, it's automated, and they didn't have it set up with a proper alarm system. So there was a big tide and a big storm and a big flooding event. And um, they flooded something like six stories of this underground building before anyone realized that this $300 million building for sewage treatment was actually flooded. Then uh, they were supposedly did a forensic audit to find out what actually went wrong and never publicly released the results. So we don't really know what happened, but we didn't have a, uh, uh, it was basically inoperable for two years. We didn't have any after. <laughs> um, and uh, it's currently in operation, but the storm sewers and the sanitary sewers are connected. So in, a new, in new developments, you, cannot, you don't have them connected because storm sewers are clean because they have rainwater. So you don't want to have to spend all your money treating rainwater. Rainwater is already clean. You want to spend all your money treating your sewage. But they're combined, which means every time it rains, the water volume is so high, you can't treat it. So you dump it all into the environment again. So they had a nice uh, photo shot of the mayor going to swim in the water. And the next day, it rained. And then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the counts in the water were too high to actually allow people to swim. So um, just remember that if you go out to go out to Halifax. So in any case, I mentioned before that I wanted to choose uh, different biological measures that the public would understand. So diversity is easy because people know they can understand death. Okay, things are things are gone. That means they're dead. People can understand that. Uh, immunomodulation. We wanted to look at the immune function of muscles, and we looked at if their immune system was uh, impaired and whether they had fungal infections. People can understand that. They understand infections. They understand uh, the immune system. Uh, one of the other things we looked at was um, what we, we did cores of the sediment. And we looked to see um, the community diversity of an organism called a benthic foraminifera. And these are little organisms that sit on the surface of the sediment. And different populations of them are more or less sensitive to changes in salinity, changes in temperature, changes in contamination load. So we use that with aging and with contamination profiles to look at things before and after colonization over 250 years. We also looked at endocrine disruption, which means sex changes, so transsexual snails. And everyone likes those, those, uh, those kind of headlines. And then we looked to see how all this impacted the intertidal community. So the first thing we did was we looked at species diversity. And if you look at the number of species here, what you see is um, uh, because it gets so cold in the wintertime, a lot of species actually don't make it, over the, make, it over the, this, um, make it over the cold period. And a lot of them actually get removed off the beach when ice flows come to the shore. So the species diversity on the East Coast is quite a bit lower than it is over here. So even at reference sites, they only have 35 or 40 species. So what we found is as you moved out of the harbor, the species diversity increased. And we had known this from, uh, from anecdotal evidence uh, from other people that not only did the species diversity increase as you left, but the communities look completely different. So historically, people had told us that the, the pictures you see up here with this rockweed, which is big and dense and thick and rich, used to be everywhere all over the harbor. It's virtually absent inside of the harbor now. So these bottom sites on top of the the rocks, you can see almost no algae. And underneath the rocks, it's, they're very few, very few encrusting, very few species. But what you do see on top are mussels and barnacles, so more encrusting species. And just to remind you, what do mussels and barnacles eat? They eat filter feeding poop. So there was lots of food for them. Now, one of the things we noticed is one of the um, uh, predators for barnacles and mussels, which are dog whelks, which are little tiny uh, snails, uh, they were missing from the sites. Like, this is really odd. Their, foods, their food type is here, but they're not at the site. So what we started to do, we looked more carefully at these. And what we discovered is that um, they were suffering from some, something called imposex, which is an endocrine disruption uh, uh, condition in which the male genitalia is superimposed over the female genitalia in these snails. These are not hermaphroditic snails. So they, don't have, they don't normally have male and female parts. When the, the penis gets superimposed on the female genitalia, they're still producing eggs internally. And so when they try to release their eggs, they actually rupture and die. So if you have high rates of imposex in a community of whelks, they'll actually die out. Problem is, if animals are missing, you can't figure out why. So luckily for us, so what we found was that the, the dark bars here is where we had, uh, had imposex. But we didn't, have, uh, uh, we didn't have any dog whelks found where there was an X. And so we had a number of these sites where we actually couldn't find any dog whelks at all and were puzzled over what was happening. 
So then we tried to look at another species, a smaller species called a periwinkle, and they had something called intersex. So in that condition, snails that have intersex actually can survive. So you can actually see both sets of genitalia on these um, snails. And what we found is that throughout all of the sites, we had intersex in the, in the periwinkles, uh, this, uh, this endocrine disruption condition. And that likely that was the reason why they were extirpated at a number of these different sites in the harbor. And the reason why this was occurring was because of the presence of a compound called tributyl tin, which is used as an anti-fouling agent on boats, but hasn't been used for 20 years. So it's actually been banned globally. Um, it's been, uh, the uh, Navy even, even uh, voluntarily banned it. But because it's a metal, it doesn't break down. It's persistent in the sediment. So there are, um, there's a huge history of, of uh, naval activities and marine activities in Halifax Harbor. And so lots of shipyards, lots of old paint that's got shipped off. And you can illicitly buy it at um, uh, boating supply stores. So people still, still sometimes use it on their recreational yachts. And it's causing uh, huge problems in the community. So what we discovered was when the uh, dog welts were absent, and again, they eat on the mussels and barnacles, there, were, there was less algae, um, and the mussels and barnacles just took off. And it also made the community very vulnerable to invasion by alien species. So invasive green crabs were coming in, and the total species diversity dropped off. So one chemical, tributyl tin, was affecting specifically um, the mortality of one species, the dog whelk, which is the major predator for two encrusting species, which then took off. And when the, with the amount of food that was available from the sewage, it just created an environment in which the encrusting species could dominate. And then the algae had no opportunity to colonize the beach. So it, can, it absolutely changed the whole uh, structure of the community there. Now, what I'm going to move on to now is talking more about the mechanisms of toxicity. So we've been talking more about the ecosystem level, the population level, the individual level. Now we're going to barrel down through looking more at mechanisms at the cellular and molecular level. So as I did my work, except for Britannia Creek or Britannia Beach, um, there are usually a small number of pollution-hardy species that can survive in one location. So when I started doing this work, um, there came a time um, when I was looking at these different species, trying to categorize them as pollution sensitive, pollution intolerant, and then my mother became diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And we were very concerned about this phenomenon of multiple drug resistance, in which tumors can become spontaneously resistant to a whole host of different chemotherapeutic drugs, including ones they hadn't been exposed to before. And I wondered whether that kind of phenomenon could be happening in other animals and could be helping to allow animals to become pollution resistant. And in fact, that's, that is the case. So uh, just to give those of you that may not have a toxicological background just a, a quick primer on it. This is a cell. And a xenobiotic is a foreign compound. So it can be a drug. It can be a chemical. It can be something that we eat. And uh, uh, it, uh, in the traditional view, it magically gets into the cell by osmosis. And then it undergoes uh, metabolism and is modified by phase one metabolites, that is cytochrome P450s. And then it can go uh, where a functional group gets added. And then you can go under uh, phase two metabolism, such as um, glutathione as transferase, and add a large polar group. And then it magically gets out of the cell. And you want to make it more hydro, um, uh, hydrophilic, so you can basically pee it out of the body. Now, it turns out it's actually more complicated than that. So if you think about the lipid bilayer, it's actually uh, biophysically um, uh, quite complicated to get cells from, the, or to get compounds from the blood, which is a hydrophilic environment, through a lipid bilayer, which is a fatty environment, and then back into the center of the cell, which is uh, more hydrophilic again. So it turns out that there are transporters um, that both facilitate the entry and the exit of different compounds. And they have different specificities. There's all sorts of different families. Um, the multidrug resistant transporters um, have gone through some nomenclature changes. They're now called ABC transporters, ATP binding cassette transporters. Uh, the, way, the reason why they got their name is because they use energy, so ATP. The reason why that's important is that if you use energy, you can transport against a concentration gradient, because that's what you want. So if you have osmosis, then in your brain and in your blood, you're going to have the same levels of a neurotoxin. If you can transport against concentration gradient, you can pump all the nasty stuff out of the brain back into the blood so that you don't have the neurotoxin in the brain anymore. 
And that's going to come up to play a little bit later. So I focused on, um, uh, lots of people are studying things that are going into the cell, but I was more interested in how things are getting out of cells. So study these ABC transporters or these multidrug resistant transporters for excretion and how that could play a role in drug resistance or multi-xenobiotic resistance. And what are the interactions between the phase one and the phase two metabolites and these different drug transporters. So the first one of these we're going to talk about, um, um, uh, and this is a bit historical because we started discovering one after another, after another, after another. So Vic Ling, who uh, used to be at the BC Cancer Center, he's now at the uh, Terry Fox Institute. He actually discovered the P-glycoprotein here in Vancouver. And that was the first one of these multidrug resistant transporters that was discovered. Um, there's, just to give you a brief outline, there's sort of three different families. You've got this P-glycoprotein. They tend to transport um, uh, moderately hydrophobic, amphipathic, uh, either neutral or slightly positively charged substances. They tend to be natural products, which is why a lot of drugs are transported by them. Then there was another family, which is the um, MDR-associated proteins, um, the MRP2s, um, where they tend to transport more um, anionic substrates like glutathione, so more of the phase two metabolites. And then they had this breast cancer resistance protein. The names were terrible, which is why they changed the nomenclature, because they found it in a breast cancer resistant um, uh, cell line. And that transports um, some sulfonated conjugates. So all sorts of different families that were transporting all these different things. But there's some overlap in the substrate specificity. The reason why I'm showing you this is that these transporters were very um, uh, promiscuous. They transport thousands of different things. And when you're thinking about drug-drug disposition and you're thinking about drug-drug interactions, you want to have some understanding about the specificity of how drugs or chemicals are moving in the body and how they're binding with these kinds of transporters or receptors. Because a transporter which is um, willing to transport hundreds or thousands of different things can be very vulnerable to chemical inhibition. So you can imagine a situation where a compound in the environment could be considered benign because when it's gone through a toxicity test, acting on its own doesn't seem toxic, doesn't attack any organs, gets out of the body, seems fine. But it may bind very closely with one of these transporters and basically inactivate its activity. So that other compounds in the environment, which may be at very, very low levels, but may be highly potent, such as certain neuro neurotoxins, which normally don't have an effect because they're removed out of the blood-brain barrier because these transporters sit there, now start to accumulate in the brain and start to have impacts. And you can imagine all sorts of different um, scenarios of that happening. And that's uh, rampant throughout uh, clinical work because one of the um, most potent um, peak glycoprotein inhibitor is cyclosporin A, which is the most commonly used um, uh, immunosuppressive drug for transplant patients. And and it turns out the reason why patients are so vulnerable to neurotoxicity, nephrotoxicity, hepatotoxicity is because by inhibiting these transporters that normally protect all their organs, when they're exposed to other things, either food that they're eating, other toxins in the environment, other drugs, they accumulate on levels that are much higher than the general population and can cause this kind of toxicity. So we wanted to work in fish. Now, one of the reasons why we like to work in fish or other animals that aren't human is that people don't like it when they take your kids away and experiment on them and tell them who to breed with. So by working with these experimental models, it allows us to, uh, uh, to do experiments that we can't do in humans. And by working in fish, we can work in a vertebrate model, which is a bit more closely related to humans, same kind of organs, response in similar ways. So uh, the first thing we needed to do is find out if whether these proteins even exist in these animals. And at that point, we had a few antibodies we could use. And luckily for us, they cross-reacted in fish. So the red, the red staining you have here, this is a liver. And this staining here in red is actually indicative of um, the biocanaliculi. And that's that portion of the hepatocyte, which is the, some of the major cells in the liver, across which bile is excreted. So if you want to get rid of things, chemicals are excreted across the biocanalicula into the gallbladder and then removed out of the fish or out of the person. And then we also found it in a bunch of other organs, including on the periphery of the intestinal cells. So this is a sort of a fold of the intestine cut here. Again, it's on the, uh, on the, on the lumen side. Now, the other thing we noticed is that in animals that were exposed to contaminants, you could get induction, that is, higher levels of this protein would exist. So we had an experiment that was done actually after the Exxon Valdez spill. Most of you won't remember that, but there was a huge oil spill in Alaska 
um, uh, uh, in the old days, in the 80s, and we had collections of these intertidal fish that were always studying near where the oil spill were and further away. And sites where there was exposure to oil, you had very high levels of this defense, this defense uh, peak glycoprotein. And so we thought this was good evidence that it was acting as this defense mechanism. So um, in the old days, if you wanted to look at a, a function of um, different genes, um, and this is at the time when it was really, really difficult to clone genes. We didn't have any of the genomic information. We didn't have the Human Genome Project completed yet. And so an entire graduate student's lifetime would be cloning a portion of one gene uh, in one species, if you were lucky. In humans, it would be easier because there'd be more people working on it. Trying to work on a non-laboratory organism was really, really difficult. So, um, and also at this time, it wasn't possible to create, you could create knockout mice, but for technical reasons, you couldn't create knockout fish. You could do some transients with juveniles, but it really wasn't very effective. So what I chose to do is to take advantage of this drug, cyclosporin A, which could be an inhibitor. And we could chemically inhibit the activity of the transporters and see if we could look at in vivo active function of these transporters in the living animals. And how could we do that? So, the first thing we wanted to do is figure out which of the organs, by using this kind of an assay, could we see the biggest sort of changes. And what we found is we could definitely measure massive changes in um, the excretion of different uh, chemicals out of the liver into the gallbladder. We could do the same thing in the ovary, and we could do the same thing in the brain. And so when we did these experiments initially, um, uh, we had to sacrifice the animals because we had to assess how much of the, the drug was ending up in the different organs. And I, I really didn't want to have to kill the animals. I really wanted to figure out what was happening in animals that were moving and living and moving around. So how am I going to do that? So I'm thinking, OK, we can do something with the brain. And we can look. I want to see if I can come up with an experiment where we can look in real time. Why don't we choose a neurotoxin and see if that neurotoxin might change behavior? And we could use the change in behavior as a model for the permeation of that drug into the brain. And we could look at that as a, as a function of the activity of these transporters. So if we inhibit the activity of the transporter at the blood-brain barrier, more drug will get into the brain, we'll have more pathological behavior. And could we look at that in real time? So the, uh, the first issue is that um, if you naively go into doing behavioral studies, there's a whole body of, of, of ethology and looking at behavior. And it's very, very difficult. You have to set up special controls because there's all sorts of handling impacts that you can have. And so I knew that there was this big issue. And so I decided to, a buddy of mine was an ethologist. And I decided I was going to pair up with him. And we're going to do these experiments. We're going to use cyclosporin A to block the activity. And we're going to choose an environmental chemical that people were quite concerned about, which is ivermectin. Ivermectin is used in human medicine for getting rid of mites, getting rid of parasites on skin. It's part of Merck's free drug program in Africa. Yeah. Um, but it's also used to get rid of sea lice in fish farms. So we're scattering that all over the ocean in all those fish farms that everyone is concerned about with all these infestation of sea lice that we're concerned about with sea lice and also going on to native fish who have never been exposed to ivermectin before. So let's focus on that and see if we can look at that. Because it was known that ivermectin was a good substrate for, um, for the peak glycoprotein, for this multidrug resistant transporter. Because when they created knockout mice in a lab in, um, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, a week after they created the knockout mice for MDR, they woke up in the morning and all the micelets were dead. What happened? Turned out they'd had a mite infestation in the animal uh, care center, and they had treated them all with ivermectin. And there was an increase by 500-fold of ivermectin in the brain with those animals. So normally, ivermectin, they give it to kids. It's considered non-toxic, because uh, non-toxic for humans, because we have an intact blood-brain barrier, and these transporters prevent the uh, permeation of this drug into the brain. So the only problem I had is my friend didn't work in fish. He worked in wolves. So I had to convince him that it was easier for us to bring fish into the lab than it was to bring wolves. And he agreed. So we spent a lot of time looking at fish and trying to figure out what do normal fish do and what do pathological fish do. So we looked at the general motor activity of fish. We looked at their pectoral fins, which are little fins on the side. And we looked at something called haptic reactivity, because I wanted to have an ecological measure. So haptic reactivity is actually um, it's an, it's an, it's an evasion. It's, it's to get away from a predator. 
So um, you've, if you did any ecology courses or behavior courses where you go into, and there's a tank full of fish, or you go to a fish hatchery and someone bangs on the, on, the, on the tank and all the fish go to one side, or there's a shadow that goes over the top of the fish and they all move to one side. So it's an evasion from a predator, so a bird swooping down or another predator coming away. The haptic reactivity is how quickly an animal makes sort of this S-curve for the fish to swim away and get away from danger. So it's, a, um, it's an intrinsic um, uh, uh, response, and we wanted to see if that was impaired. And we just did a very, um, we're looking for big crude changes, big, big crude um, uh, scoring system, no activity at zero and a high activity at three. And we made observations um, every 10 minutes after we injected them with these drugs uh, for two hours. So what we found here is the blue lines, if we look at general motor activity at the top here, the blue line is the control. So again, it's behavior study. We've got to have a proper control. This is a vehicle control in which we just had saline that was going into the animal. We had additional controls that, I, that I'm not reporting on here. Then we had a set of animals that were just exposed to ivermectin. And we wanted to give a big enough dose where we could actually see a change. So we wanted to actually see some impact, some pathology from the ivermectin-only fish. So by the end of this experiment, we had a score of about 1.5 for the, uh, the ivermectin-only fish, which meant that their, their general motor activity, they weren't, they weren't swimming so well anymore. And then for the animals that were given ivermectin, but also had their blood-brain barrier, the, the, the peak-like protein, the multidrug resistance transporters in their blood-brain barrier was inhibited by cyclosporin A, they almost had no activity at all by the end of the experiment. So twice the effect that the ivermectin-only fish had. If we looked at actually the movement of the pectoral fins, we had the same thing, the same trend, about twice the effect as soon as you added cyclosporin A and disturbed the blood-brain barrier. And then when we looked at the haptic reactivity, how well, how efficient were they at evading predators? Again, twice the effect once you disrupted the blood-brain barrier and the amount of ivermectin getting into the brain was increased. Now, in addition to this, because we were using high levels, we wanted to see whether this would have an effect on mortality similar to what it had in mammals. And what we found is that control animals, there's no mortality. And with these experiments, when I say mortality, this, these were showing evidence of symptoms that would lead to mortality in the future after the experiment had terminated. So with ivermectin-only uh, fish, we had evidence about an hour and 10 minutes for um, the first fish. And then about 25% of those fish um, had evidence of mortality by the end of the experiment. But over 70% had that if you disturbed the blood-brain barrier by uh, disturbing the, uh, the activity of the multidrug resistant transporter, and it happened as early as 20 minutes. So these transporters, this is the first evidence in fish then, that these transporters were actually protection against mortality from these, from these types of neurotoxins. Now, um, we've got a little bit of time left. I'm just going to tell one more, one more story here. So when we finished this experiment, um, I started wondering, wow, this is, this is really profound. We know, we, know, we know about the evidence that we've seen in, in mice in mammals, there was well-known evidence in the veterinary literature that you don't give ivermectin to collies because they'll die. Turned out some uh, strains of collies have a defect in the uh, pig glycoprotein in the MDR gene. Um, but what about people? Lots of, lots of people are getting ivermectin in the free drug, drug program. Now, unfortunately, in the areas where um, ivermectin is most used with larger populations where you have these parasitic infections in Africa, people are really, really far from clinical settings. So there were no epidemiological studies following up to see if there were any clinical impacts of people being exposed to ivermectin who might have been co-exposed to other factors would have, which would have potentially caused a neurotoxicity. However, there was one report in an Alzheimer's clinic in which there was a uh, set of patients in a, in a closed, confined unit where a grandchild had come to visit, had scabies, grand, grandparent contracted it, spread it among the other patients, and they treated the patients with a therapeutic dose of ivermectin. Over the next six months, there was a 60% uh, increase in mortality only among those patients who were given the ivermectin treatment. Now, there's many uh, uh, explanations for that. Uh, people with Alzheimer's could, ha could happen to have a leaky uh, blood-brain barrier. Um, many of them are taking uh, complex drug regimes. Um, uh, a number of different heart drugs like verapamil, which some of those patients might have taken, are also potent inhibitors of multidrug resistant uh, proteins. Um, so uh, uh, it just is a, is a very uh, a nice illustration of how important it is to understand what the mechanism of attack of different chemicals are and how they interact with one another, how they're detoxified, 
both not just through metabolism, but through transport and disposition within the cells and within the different organs. If we have a good understanding for that, we're more likely to be able to predict some of these drug-drug interactions or to be able to explain when you get a massive mortality event, either in the human population or in an ecosystem uh, uh, event. Uh, there's been events, for example, in the North Sea in which there have been massive die-offs of seals that have happened. Is it because there was pollution? Is it because there was a viral infection? There's a number of different factors people were concerned with. Was it because there were algal toxins? Probably it's a combination of multiple events uh, happening simultaneously which made the animals vulnerable uh, to, to an event that caused a pathology. So understanding that mechanism, but also being able to pull back from the molecular mechanisms, the um, cellular mechanisms, and looking at the whole organism and the whole community can give you a bigger picture of what's happening and allow you to take that information to try to apply that towards management. What chemicals should we be controlling? Which ones should we be uh, using in combination? Uh, which ones need to be, how should we be thinking about new chemicals being produced and being used in the environment? And uh, what, what should we do for the future to prevent the development of new compounds which cause problems in the future? So for example, Many compounds are produced because they have a certain physical structure that we find attractive, like PCBs. They're really stable. And we find out later, they're really stable. We can't get rid of them. So um, if we understand how they act, that can may give us some more insight on whether we should actually produce certain chemicals or not. So thank you for your attention, and I'm very happy to ask uh, to take any questions. I'm just going to start with a point of clarification. What's a knockout mouse? Ah, so um, so a knockout mouse, apologize for that. So um, uh, in the early stages of genetic research, again, this is before we actually had the full genomes for different organisms, we were able to identify um, certain genes. And we wanted to know what the function of those genes were. So the idea was if you could actually eliminate that gene out of the genome for a mouse, because they did these experiments with mice, you could reproduce them really well in the laboratory, you could actually compare the physiology and the phenotype of those knockout mice for one particular gene versus the control mice. And so they, when they first started doing this work, they really focused on different um, uh, diseases. So the CFTR gene, so for the cystic fibrosis, turns out the cystic fibrosis gene is actually one of these, is in the same family as these multidrug resistant transporters. Uh, knock that out, see which organs you end up having defects in, and can you design drugs to help you to address that? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Um, how much variability is there in the abundance of these MDR proteins in human populations, and could that be used to determine either vulnerability to exposure or suitability yeah. for certain kinds of employment? That's an excellent question. That's really an excellent question. Um, one of the, one of the um, challenges when a field starts, and this field is still relatively young um, for ABC transporters. When you go to the ABC transporter meetings, there's only about 80 people there worldwide. Um, and it sort of came out of a small number of labs. So a lot of the work has really focused on X-ray crystallography, looking at the structure of the proteins, looking at tumor cell lines. No one's looked at epidemiology as far as I know. There may have been some people that have since I've, in the last few years, but, but I'm not aware of it so far. The work that I've been doing in the natural populations uh, in fish is kind of complementary to the kind of work, the kind of question that you're asking. Because my questions were, we're working with laboratory animals, which are strains, which are inbred. That's not telling us anything about the variability in the human population. We know that phase one and phase two enzymes have huge variability within different populations and different ethnic groups. And that's why certain populations or certain ethnic groups are more susceptible to toxicity of certain drugs. You have to be careful um, about cytochrome P453A for certain drugs. If you take grapefruit in the morning, you might induce it. All sorts of different things that can happen. I believe, likely, there's a lot of variability in, in the MDRs as well. Now, one thing is because of that promiscuity that I mentioned, that they transport many different things, and there is this substrate overlap, it's basically a, sort of a built-in additional defense mechanism. So even if you did have a pure knockout on one side, there would be some coverage of some of the other compounds that could be transported with less affinity by some of the other uh, transport mechanisms. And also, some of them could be detoxified by some of the um, metabolites as well. Um, it's only because humans have gone in and bred dogs uh, 
that we ended up with collies that, that are, happen to be deficient in, in MDR1. It's likely that any of these um, uh, more potent mutations likely wouldn't have persisted. Um, but uh, CFTR is a really powerful one. So uh, the cystic fibrosis transporter, that certainly has a huge number of defects in it. It's, a, it's in the same family, but it just transports chloride as opposed to the drugs. But it's, it's, it has a similar function, a similar, uh, similar structure. But, it, but a great question. It would be a great topic of research for anyone who's interested. Hi. Um, so if these transporters are inhibited, are there a lot of other physiological effects other than these toxicological ones, or are these yeah. the predominant ones? Okay, so that's a, that's an excellent question. So um, there's several different ways that you can think about inhibition. So the ones that I've been describing is is more specific, where the inhibition is basically a chemical inhibition because of the competition. So you have two substrates. One has a higher affinity than the other. The thing with the higher affinity basically binds to it. It's slow to let go, and it causes this other compound to accumulate. However, um, the membrane of the cell is a lipid bilayer. So there are things that solubilize lipid bilayers. And for an organism like a fish that has a gill that is exposed to water, if you have things in the environment like um, uh, detergents, that can solubilize it and make it more vulnerable to having other chemicals uh, uh, enter. So one of the projects that I was involved in was actually looking at Arctic um, oil spill recovery. And at that point, it was the, this is before the, um, uh, the Deepwell Horizon uh, spill in, in New Mexico, um, looking to see in a cold environment, how are you going to deal with an oil spill? We don't have a lot of people, but you have a plane where you could fly over and dump a bunch of oil dispersants. And oil dispersants are basically detergent. So because of the laws of conservation of energy and mass, if you disperse it, it's still there. It's just in smaller pieces. Um, and what you actually have done is you've taken these small little droplets, these big blobs of oil, you've broken them down in small little droplets with this detergent all around it, which is, and they're very, very tiny, which has made it perfect to be absorbed by marine organisms <laughs> or anybody that's swimming in the water and come through their skin. So you've actually now created this great delivery system to um, get this toxin into, into animals, but you can't see it on the surface. So that sort of gets back to my theme that if you understand the mechanism, then you can make some predictions on whether certain actions will have positive or negative effects. And sometimes you have to choose things that have some negative effects because the payoff is greater uh, for dealing with some of these issues. But at least if you understand the mechanism to begin with, you can make um, uh, a science-based decision. Thank you. I'd like to go back to Halifax Harbor for a second. and. You were saying, you know, you, you couldn't, I think they were the whelks, you couldn't find these That's whelks right. in some areas. And, and when you say couldn't find, does that, that mean that you pulled out all the stops or in the survey that you had designed, you didn't see any? So, so, so yes. So we had a, a, a transect down the beach, which is a line down the beach, and a certain part of the beach, um, and all these beaches, we looked at the same, similar kind of rocks. And so in some areas where we had these whelks, you'd find thousands of them. And then maybe other areas you wouldn't find as many. And then some areas you don't find any. So you have eight people for three hours looking for whelks. And we don't, we don't find any, both on top of the rock and underneath. So for animals that are very common, we would have assumed that we would have found them. Now, for very, there are some species that are rare. And there is something called a discovery curve. So the more effort you put into something, the more likely you are to find more species and the diversity goes up. But for a common species, putting that much effort into it, you would have expected to have found them. So that's why, that's why it was so puzzling. And then once, you don't, once they're not there, you don't know what the cause is. So we were very fortunate that there was a second species we could, we could then look at. Thank you. Thanks, that's great. I'm wondering about policy implications. So at the moment, chemicals um, don't go through any screening before they come on to uh, consumer uh, horizons and things like that. Um, and then I'm also thinking of examples like um, uh, tech uh, being on an international border and any time that the states have tried to um, inhibit their uh, dumping, it's, it's had to go to international court, which mm -hmm. doesn't happen, yada, yada, yada. So uh, if you were to, at what stage with mm -hmm. the state of the art now, 
would you be able to go forward and propose policy? Um, right. So, so environment. So, so for some, so there are. So, for example, um, uh, PG&E, so Procter and Gamble, they actually have their own laboratories. When they're formulating new compounds for personal care products, they actually do toxicity testing, and they they determine whether they're safe or not. So, there there are some chemicals which are screened before they enter the marketplace because they're going to be cosmetics or this or that. Um, Environment Canada is also doing some screening, but all this screening is on one compound at a time. And the reason for that is that once you add it, start doing a matrix and do multiple compounds, the cost is just extraordinary. So um, they used to do a lot of toxicity testing on fish. It's, a, it's less expensive than doing it on mice, but it's still expensive. You're still sacrificing animals. They're trying to move to doing things more in cell lines. It's still expensive. And usually what happens is they discover something's a problem, and then they back up. And see, so PFOSs, which are a family of compounds that are um, brominated and are involved in uh, fire retardants, now they're sort of the, the flavor of the season of, of determining um, how toxic they are. There's a balance there for those because they are flame retardant. So how much of life are you saving by having the flame retardant um, uh, 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 technology versus the potential toxic sides? Um, so unfortunately, there's often a big disconnect from between what's happening on the industry side, what's happening on the government side, and then what sort of we, we see sort of in the public. Um, and a lot of it has to do with money, unfortunately. So uh, if, we ha if Environment Canada had more resources, they might be in a position where they could either demand or do their own testing, but they currently don't have the capacity for that. So ideally, that, was, that would be what you want. Would have, you'd have a regulatory regime that would put the onus perhaps similar to what we have with the FDA or we have with Health Canada, where it's on the onus of the producer to demonstrate that something's safe before it enters the market. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to say that uh, in, in terms of testing um, chemicals and before they enter the marketplace, I know that uh, I used to work in the United States, and yes. so uh, there's uh, there's quite a program uh, there. But then also, I know about the REACH initiative, and I haven't been paying attention mm. to it for for quite a while. But in Europe, um, that's exactly what they're doing. They're mm -hmm. they're you know they're testing the chemicals before they hit the marketplace. There's toxicity yeah. tests that are done and, and and such. And I think if Canada doesn't, I, I realize that Canada may not have the ability or the capacity to do that testing mm -hmm. themselves, but they can take from yes. all, all those other... That's right. And there are databases. When you do uh, risk assessments, there are databases that rely on um, um, uh, the EU, the Netherlands, uh, the US, where they pool um, all the metadata uh, from other studies that were done, and you can actually get that information and then go look at the original studies so that there isn't a duplication of effort. You're, you're, entirely, you're entirely right. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your interesting work with us. So I'm just going to complement uh, Karen's policy question uh, with practical mm -hmm. implications for uh, recreation water inspections or, or regulations. So as, as your focus is on coastal waters, mm -hmm. and much of it could be totally recreational beach settings, mm -hmm. um, you know, other than see the evidential uh, manifestations of the transsexual snails and whatnot, it would take some time before policy could be set around based on the, the, the laboratory results that could, could change inspections and whatnot. So, so what to do um, yeah. for those who are in those inspectoral rows? Yeah. No, that, that's a great question. So, what are, so one, of the, one of the things I mentioned before is the problem with looking at diversity is that animals have had to have died for that to happen. So can we create different biological markers that will look at the health of different organisms that would give, you, give us a warning signal earlier so we would actually have the chance to, to enact different legislation? So right now in the States, over the last uh, eight years, I believe it is, NOAA and NIH have pooled money together to do an Oceans and Human Health Initiative. And so they've been actually looking at, they, they targeted a number of different things. They looked at algal toxins because on the human health side, uh, there have been a number, especially in the warmer climates, there have been a number of issues of algal toxins where there's been um, uh, different blooms of different species that's caused mortality for humans or paralysis. Uh, and um, then looking at things like Vibrio cholera, um, looking at epidemics in shellfish. Uh, and then the other one is um, uh, global climate change. Now, on the pathogen side, they've actually done some work that shows that in certain areas where there's a lot of algal blooms and there's sewage issues, people tend to be sicker. If there's, there's a correlation between the time they spend at the beach 
swimming and playing in the sediment and how sick they get, which is really discouraging. Um, and it, we were really surprised to see that you could actually pick that trend out. But that's, that's what's been coming out of uh, uh, some of the, the NOAA work uh, in the US in this initiative. And part of that effort is, again, to um, uh, make us aware of what um, is actually going on in the water. Because it looks transparent and it looks like it's fine, we kind of ignore it. If you don't see it, you ignore it. And so trying to find some features to give us some warning that something's going on, not just to protect the environment, but also to, to protect ourselves. And when you can step in with the regulations, it, it's such a great question and there isn't a good answer to it. But part of it is having um, a well-informed electorate and a well-informed well um, science-driven policy culture within the government. And the current government appears to be a little bit more interested in that. Uh, <laughs> the previous government, I had at least 12 colleagues that um, uh, the entire toxins program at DFO, which was a world-renowned, uh, Peter Ross is now at the Vancouver Aquarium. He lost his job all doing marine mammal work and, and toxicology. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, who is at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, he was the world expert on oil spills in the Arctic. He was fired, and the week, the week later, uh, Harper stepped up and said, Canada is going to be the leader with oil spills in the Arctic. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they got, all, that entire program was, was eliminated, and all that uh, uh, intellectual capacity was lost. But perhaps there's some, there's some hope for the future. We, we won't talk about the Trump government. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shannon.